Welcome to Hattie.com's Zoom Open House. I forgot to record the brief int introduction I shared with you the other night, so I'm making it up right now. Um, before we um, hand the screen back to our uh, guest speakers tonight, um, I would like to share with you a little bit about Hattie.com since this is a very brand new platform. So how was Hattie born? Here you go about us. Hattie.com was born as a Help Our Teachers project, HOT. As a growth officer for LO7.com, a top B2B digital English curriculum provider and a cutting edge educational tech company, I have personally observed that teaching hours for our teachers are being reduced. So, okay, so let's take a look at it. Um, LO7.com, since not all of you are familiar with this company. So LO7.com is in China and they work with thousands of uh, schools. They only work with schools to provide curriculum and educational platform. Since 2016, I have been uh, leading LO7's global recruiting and management efforts to recruit thousands of global teachers to teach with LO7, actually to teach for schools like New Oriental, New Oriental Xindongfang, which is a public traded company on NASDAQ under the symbol EDU, and many other companies like Angli, only uh, in Shanghai and Race and you name it. Many, many large schools work with LO7. So we hire global teachers. I lead the effort of high global teachers and bring them to teach the students of the schools in China. I led the development of tutor.lo7.com. You can see from here, uh, we have thousands of um, applicants and teachers working with us. 80% of them are based in the United States. We also have a blog.lo7.com, which I led. We have about 25,000 to 30,000 uh, visits per month. And you can see from here, okay? And uh, in addition to working with LO7, I am also a co-founder of Nextstream Technical Institute. And uh, I believe many of you here um, are our students. Um, so I'm gonna just very briefly go over the company. Uh, we teach machine learning right now. I will launch many other um, STEM related engineering classes to middle school and high school students. We also provide uh, lots, of, lots of internship opportunities for high school and college students. Uh, who are interested in computer science and engineering. So here I am, and uh, um, I co-founded with two other partners. We all three of us are Qualcomm veterans. We used to work for Qualcomm. Here's Mr. Morrow, uh, who teaches at Canyon Crest, the number one California public school, number one public school in California, Mr. Morrow, and Babak. So we three co-founded the company here at NextStream, okay? And lastly, I just want to show you my LinkedIn. If you're interested in check out my background, um, since Hattie.com is very, very new. And here's Hattie.com, here's um, the background. Okay, so go through that. Okay, what else? So, so now I want to talk to you a little bit about Hattie, more about Hattie uh, after we've gone through the introduction of the background, why we launched Hattie. So at Hattie, we work with um, top educators top educators, very experienced educators. We have been working with them like Miss Lexington and Miss Pond at LO7 for quite a few years. At LO7, we have very strict um, um, system to um, measure our teacher's stability and our teacher's teaching quality. So it's all tabulated with data. We have huge database. Um, so we only select the best of the best of our teachers who have experience in teaching grade five up to grade 12 um, to, to Hattie platform. 
Um, so you can see Ms. Lexington's um, the debate classes. We launched the first debate classes to our students, bilingual students in China because of Chinese New Year. However, all curriculum is the same um, to global curriculum, global teachers. And we also la launched a class, a, pro a class just this past week on February 24th to US students. And the class is completely overbooked and only eight students, our maximum capacity is eight students. So now we added a brand new class starting March 9th. Um, we still have some availability. So please feel free to sign up here. And once you sign up, you can pay here. Once you make the payment, you will be automatically invited to our um, to our um, teachers forum and, and also with, with interaction with your classmates and with your teacher. So that's the class we're launching. And um, we also, here go. We also have Ms. Pont um, who has started college counseling services with us, also writing classes with us. And uh, we have launched the classes um, again in China during Chinese New Year. And it's very successful. Um, all students except for one who can't work out a schedule move up to uh, her level two classes and the, he, her level one classes is launching, which is uh, starting um, March 15th, Monday. Um, you can also see Ms. Pan's background here, full background, and the schools that she helped her students to get into it. So a lot of top schools, I think, Regarding IV, except for Dartmouth, uh, she has experience to bring students to all IVs, except for Dartmouth. And of course, Stanford and MIT, and a lot of great schools. A lot of schools in US, top 100, they're all great schools. Okay, so that's Ms. Pond. And here you go. So we have the class master reading and master write, master, mastering reading and writing level one, level two with Ms. Pond, and the schedule here, public here. Okay, so. Before I hand over the screen to our internship, intern team. So I wanna hear talk very briefly about our intern team. We had four interns were working with us the summer of 2020 during COVID um, um, uh, lockdown. And two of the middle school, uh, high school students and two of them are college students. And they work, they've been working, they will work together. They worked together and developed a 20 to 30 page um, product requirements uh, documents. So that was the beginning of HOT, okay? And then we have three interns joining us in the fall, Eric and uh, Ryan and Leah. Um, Leah had to go back to um, her school at UCLA. So now we have Eric and, and Ryan, we also have two new interns joining us in the spring. So today's Zoom open house will be shared by Ryan and by Eric, okay? So um, that's pretty much like the history of, uh, of, of Hattie.com and the name is uh, named after our, my family dog and uh, it's just a very playful name. So hopefully you will enjoy it. The logo is design, designed by our 14-year-old intern, Emily. So hopefully you, you like the logo, especially you can see the dog and the, the, the happy face here. So anyway, that's pretty much the sharing of, um, of Hattie.com, my personal background and the various programs. Again, welcome to Hattie, welcome to Hattie. And now I'm giving the screen back to Eric and Ryan, and they will kick off the sharing for tonight's topic. Thank you so much. Before I start, um, so Ryan, would you do you want to introduce yourself first? And then I'll introduce myself. Just do some quick introductions. Um, sure, yeah. Well, I'm Ryan. I am a senior at Torrey Pines. I am originally from Pennsylvania, but I've been living in San Diego for the last year. I am really into computer engineering. I've been to it, into it for like a year or two or three now. And I like self-study it pretty well. And I've like learned a lot about it. And I've been doing this internship. That's uh, been really good. And with this internship, I do like a lot of like really hard work in which I'll talk about in a few seconds, actually. 
So hey guys, I'm Eric, a freshman at Berkeley, planning to major in econ and statistics. And for me, um, education has always been a passion. I've tutored for all four years in my high school. Um, and currently I am a paid tutor and also doing college consulting on the side. Okay, so the first question is, what is it like working at Hattie? And I guess, I think it's, you know, what I do is I handle like system administration and back end tasks, which is just like managing the system itself, like the website and all that. And like all the stuff this website runs on. And then I utilize open source projects to solve different problems and fulfill feature requests. So like whenever Dan Dan is like, hey, we need this new feature or something, I try to find some open source software that'll let us do it without actually having to like you know, write something from scratch. They'll probably have all these problems anyway. We, instead, we um, use like already available, like open source free software. And then I write code to like automate projects and then integrate them into our software. And it's because sometimes I can't find code. So I just have to actually, you know, write code that will work with the um, feature requests. And also I oversee like all development for our platform. Like there's another intern that we have and I like oversee what she does and I give her um, assignments. And then we're also working with an external development team and like I'm overseeing the development plan that we're giving them and like I'm involved in that like back and forth to fit, making sure that they have a good development plan going forward. Awesome. So for me, I'm currently the only business intern and I just do a lot of business related things. So for example, Last week's project for me was researching employee stock options. Um, and this week I was assigned to do research on like the densities of um, national merit semifinalists in the US. And that was just like basically a lot of um, going through a lot of data and just uh, mapping out stuff. And um, um, <clears throat> a big part of my role is also to do a lot of idea generation for like um, the big picture goals for Hattie.com. Um, okay, so what is the weekly workload like? And for me, it like varies depending on the week because some weeks I'll have like a lot of different miscellaneous tasks. Like if teachers are having some issues or there's like some kind of technical emergency that I have to deal with because I'm basically like the buck stops here for the like techno technological stuff. So I have to figure all that stuff out. But I think the workload in general is pretty manageable. Like if I, if Dan Dan wants me to like implement a new feature or something, she'll be like, okay, can you look at this and figure it out? And she'll give me a few weeks to do it. So maybe if one week my teacher gives me all this work and I'm really super busy, I won't work on it that much. And the next week I'll work on it a lot more because I have a lot more free time. So I think that's like good how I can kind of like work it in with my school and all that. Yeah, and hourly wise, I'd um, estimate it to be around one to two hours. So we have a one hour meeting weekly but sometimes it stretches to like one and a half or maybe two hours. Actually, I think mainly one and a half. Um, and then we might have like 30 minutes to an hour of um, side meetings. So maybe I might meet with Ryan or another intern. And also um, Ryan mentioned that he, he um, meets with the external development team. And then work-wise um, for business interns, I'd say around one to three hours. So some weeks it might be like very light um, because uh, maybe Dan doesn't need us to do that much research. But some other weeks, you might assign a project that takes a lot more time. So for example, um, my current project for this week, um, it's taking a lot of time so far because I have to like parse through a lot of data and um, use um, Excel to like um, kind of crunch stuff. So yeah. Um, and then, so what have we learned at Hattie skills wise? Well, I've learned that like testing is a key part of any production platform. Because whenever we have errors, you know, I think the best way to find out how all these errors are happening and just to make sure the system's working in general is to just write tests so that we can actually ensure that all the things, all the ways that we think the system works, it actually does work in that way. And then running and working with teams like often means giving concrete goals, but with unspecific implementation details to foster creativity, which means that like, you know, you ha do have to give like some kind of, hey, you have to get this done. And this is like kind of what we need for the platform, but you don't have to specify like, this is exactly how you're going to do it. You should let them like have some free reign to figure out how they should do it because then they'll be more creative and they'll probably work with whatever they know best to uh, deliver a best, the best solution.
Yeah, and for me, um, the reason why I joined Hattie is because, um, so like, um, so Dan and I, we are both uh, not coders and we're both kind of like on the more business and uh, economics oriented side. So um, a big part of me joining this internship was to learn about how to start your own company and also a lot of um, business management practices. So yeah, I learned that starting your own company is very hard and um, trying to like trying to launch my college consulting business is also very hard. But with a tech startup, it's like much, much harder because you have to get a lot, of, um, a lot of traffic. And yeah, I also learned project management and financial modeling and also how to do research. Um, yeah. So how is the collaborative environment? Well, I think the environment is actually really collaborative because you know, me and Eric know each other really well. He actually does some college consulting for me. So when he gets to that, I can actually like offer some comments on the, how he's actually a really good college consultant. And also, you know, everyone is just really nice and friendly. And we're like this open organization where there's like, we have a lot of strong information sharing. So like everybody kind of knows what's going on with the company and there's no secrets or anything like that. And there's no like overbearing hierarchy like Dan Dan's not like you must do this you must do that like we all get to like offer our opinions and we get to talk to each other and work together and it's really nice yeah i definitely agree with that um so one example is um as i wrote here i whenever i have technical issues like i can't log in or we have to fix something and i don't know how to do it i'll, I'll discord ryan and um also we recently got a social media intern and she's like really good with social media and doing editing on photos. So uh, like, I didn't know how to do that kind of stuff. So I asked her for help and she helped me like, and you know, and then we finished that project. So that was really, really cool. Um, so if you guys have any questions regarding the internship, feel free to ask. Um, you, you can type in chat or you can also speak. Any questions? Oh, they, I think they will probably save the question to the end. So let's oh, move okay. Yeah, no problem. Oh, so we're just going to do it at the end? Yes. Okay, yes. sounds good. Okay. So now um, it's Ryan's um, part. Okay, well, this is about my computer engineering journey. And this is kind of about, these are like my basic concentrations in computer engineering you know, OS development, which is just, you know, developing operating systems, which is something I'm really interested in. I like operating systems because you get like technical stuff because, you know, it has to work with your keyboard and your like networking and all that kind of stuff. But it also has, you know, you actually run programs on it. So it's actually got this like software aspect too. So it's kind of got like a little bit of both. And I like hardware development because I think that's pretty cool because you get to work with like actual physical things sometimes. And then with the firmware development, again, you get that kind of mix of like the hardware, but then also the software, which I think is pretty cool. Um, curiosity driven learning approach. This is kind of my best explanation of how I learned all this stuff pretty quickly. And I think it's really about asking questions is like the most important thing. Because whenever you're learning something, you should always ask questions and just like, you know, be curious and just ask questions. And when you ask the question, you have to find an answer to the question or at least try, obviously. And sometimes you can usually find an answer now because you know Google's not really nice, but sometimes you'll read an answer and you'll be like, okay, I don't really understand this. Like it's probably a valid answer, but I don't understand this. Or sometimes you read an answer and you'll be like, okay, I kind of get this, but then like I have another question because it's talking about this other kind of system or concept that I don't understand at all. And that kind of brings us more things like, oh, maybe I should learn this thing because I'm like, don't understand it. And it's clearly related to the thing I'm learning. So that's kind of like my discipline process, like find um, a few sources for what I want to learn and then read like sources a chapter or two at a time. Sometimes I do video courses too. But I like to just find like a variety of sources so I can get an idea of like different ways to do things because everyone approaches it a little bit differently. And then you can just like apply what you learned, like code or, you know, even if it's just some other idea than like physically writing something down, just however you can apply what you learned.
And then this is um, the levels of computers. And this is just like kind of an idea of how computer engineering works. And you have the application layer, which is like, you know, where your browser is and where your Zoom application is that we're all running right now and all that kind of stuff. Then you have the libraries and the libraries allow the um, application to interact with the software or interact with the operating system in like a coherent way. And it also allows you to interact with other programs and the operating system, you know, it's like Windows, Mac OS, all that kind of stuff. It like runs on the hardware and allows you to run multiple programs at the same time and makes it so you don't have to like do all this complex stuff to set up your monitors and your keyboards and stuff. They just automatically configure all that kind of thing. A compiler, what it does is it takes like this code that you write, you know, if I write like hello, like print hello world, it takes that and it makes it into something that the computer can understand, like ones and zeros and binary. And then the instruction set is actually just what the compiler compiles into. It's like a set of different commands that the compiler can use to actually, you know, what the com computer can do. Like maybe the computer can add and subtract. Those would be instructions, part of the instruction set. And then the microarchitecture is how they design the CPU, which is what runs all the code. And that's like the high level design. Like maybe they want to have two things that can add at the same time so they can do like, you know, just they can do things twice as fast. If they do a lot of adding, they can add two things at the same time. And then functional units would be like the design of the individual components. Like if you actually what did the adding, you know, like it would be like some kind of combination of hardware components that could actually add numbers. And then we have gate level logic, which is like the idea that you can make any kind of complex electrical circuit out of like AND gates, which are just like, if this thing's true, this thing is true, then the output is true or like OR gates, which is like, you know, it has to be one or the other and that kind of thing. And you get to combine those and you get to make complex circuits. It's interesting. And transistors are just how they implement the gate level logic with the hardware. And then the issue though, is you might be like, oh, well, let me start at the application layer and work my way down or the opposite, start at the transistor layer and work my way up. But it's not that hard because these levels are like not so defined and they intertwine in many places because sometimes you'll be like, oh, why do we always have to um, check to make sure this thing is valid? And the answer is maybe it's something in the operating system, but you're working on the application layer so you might have to go learn about the operating system so you can understand that. And there's just like all this stuff that intertwines and it's just really hard to start at one place. So I think the best solution is just a middle out approach where you really just start coding and then you branch out from there with your questions and you find different like things you wanna study from there. Um, this is actually where I started. I started with an edX Python course. edX is like another online service. It's probably not as good as Nextream. I hear that's really good. I didn't actually like the edX course too much. It was okay. Um, originally, I thought I was going to go into finance. So I just did the course to like help me with some coding skills because, you know, people in finance, you know, they can code and it, well, some of them can code. And if you can code in finance, you can write like financial models and all that kind of thing. So the course challenged me, like it was really difficult, but it also got me interested in the fundamentals of programming and how that all works. And I recommend starting programming in some kind of course or video series. So there's a clear structure of what to learn next, because if you just Google like how to program and you like read online articles, you're not gonna get anywhere because you won't understand what you're actually supposed to do next and like what kind of project you're supposed to tackle next versus a course where it'll be like, you know, do this thing and then do that thing. Um, and after I just took that Python course, I still wasn't really that interested in programming. But I mean, I thought it was kind of cool, but I still wasn't really interested in it for a career. But then one day I decided to install Linux on my computer because I thought it seemed cool. I don't know. I was really tired with Windows and I was like, yeah, this might be cool. So then I quickly dived into using the terminal, which is just like a text based way of how to interact with your computer. And I took courses on how to use Linux and how to use like things within Linux. And system management is just how to manage like a complex Linux system. And Git, which is just managing code, the terminal, containerization, uh, networking, all that kind of thing. And then um, 
why Linux? I think is a really good question. It's like, why should you use Linux and why is it important to like actually use that if you're trying to learn this type of thing? And it's open source so you can read the code, which is a really big deal because sometimes you'll be like using something that interacts with the operating system and you'll just wonder, how does this work? And if you're in like Microsoft Windows or something like that, you can't just go and read the code to figure out how it works. And then it conforms the industry standard operating system specification, POSIX, which is this like standard that's like, okay, if you write a program, this program will work on like Windows, or not when it won't work on Windows. They're actually the only people who don't comply, but it'll work on like Linux and it'll work on Mac OS and it'll work on all these servers and stuff. So you kind of get like a more industry standard way of understanding it. And it's free, which is nice because we don't like paying for things. Um, it exposes its internals to the end user. It's great for studying. Um, most tools for, like for programming stuff are made primarily for Linux because people like to develop on it. Um, what kind of Linux do you use? A distribution is just like different types of Linux and they each have like a little bit of variation. I recommend Fedora or Debian. It's really up to personal preference, but I think those are like pretty easy to use for beginners, maybe Mint too. Um, FreeBSD and OpenBSD are really great alternatives and there's really great books for those actually, but they're kind of difficult for beginners to install and use. So I wouldn't recommend those until you get like a little bit more into that if you want to do that. And then around this time I began learning C because I was kind of like using these operating systems and learning about how I can like use these operating systems and I wanted to know how the operating systems were developed but that's all written in C and it's obviously I couldn't read that because I didn't know it. So I decided to let us learn C and C is actually used to write operating systems. And I eventually desired to learn C so I could build this deeper understanding of how Linux truly really worked. Yeah. And then I started with the KNR C book, which is a really, really famous C book. It's written by the original people who actually invented C and it really took me a long time to truly develop the ability to read and understand C since there's so much going on with like memory and like hardware and all this stuff that's going on with C, it's pretty complex. So if you actually start learning it, don't think you're just gonna be able to like go to Linux source code and read all of it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, what language do you start with? This is actually a really good question. I mean, I think this is more from a computer engineering perspective. If you want to do web development, you should definitely start with a web development language, which is not either of these. You can do web development in Python. But if you want to do computer engineering specifically, like more hardware stuff and like how it interacts with software, um, you should start with Python because it's an easy to learn language and it's helpful for writing quick programs. Like it doesn't, you can't use it to do everything. Like you can't use Python to write an operating system, but it's really good if you want to write like a really quick and simple program and it'll usually work pretty well. Um, if you want to, or if you have some experience using or coding, I recommend you use C because you can run it freestanding, which means it works without an operating system, which is why you can actually use it to make one. And that's cool because you can use like small, tiny little computers that don't have any operating system or anything, but have like all these ports that you can use to control, I don't know, whatever you want, like a light switch or some LEDs or other cool stuff like that. And it's essential for understanding assembly language and hardware design, because if you don't understand C, like, cause it's just so close to that hardware design language that you kind of get that like hand in hand, it goes, yeah. Um, you should definitely, like I said, ask questions as you code and go about other computing tasks, just to recap on this. Um, you know, how does this library course work, or how does this library call work? Um, how does this system manage resource contention, which is like if two things ask for the uh, same resource at the same time? You're like, how does, how does your computer decide which one gets it and which one doesn't get it, or does it give it to both of them, or how does that work? And how is this program translated to something that can be ran on my CPU? Like how does it get from typing the words print hello world or something like that to actually being like the ones and zeros that CPUs are able to understand? And then how does my computer get to a usable state? Like if I press the power button, 
how do I get to the point in which I can like, you know, type in my password and all that kind of thing. Um, you, you need to find answers to these questions, obviously. So you should study key computer engineering concepts and operating systems was one of my favorites, actually. And you should see FreeBSD Design Implementation by McCusick. I actually just got this book in the mail today. It's right here. Um, compilers. Um, I don't actually know too much about compilers, but they're pretty interesting. Here's a book that I recommend. I've never actually read it, but I've heard good things. Um, and on how compilers are designed. Uh, computer architecture, that's how you design CPUs that run code and it'll teach you a lot. Even if you don't want to design CPUs, it'll teach you a lot like why we write code in certain ways to make it run fast is like, that's really how you'll learn that. And then computer architecture, yeah, you really want to read this computer architecture quantitative approach. That's like the book to read. Um, we want to watch conference talks and read email lists discussing why features are implemented in certain manners. Because a lot of the time, you know, if you, especially when you're dealing with these big open source projects, people actually will literally just write emails to like Linux. If you want to contribute something, you literally just write an email to the Linux people and you're like, hey, here's what I want to contribute. It's great. Um, and when you write your contributions, you actually have to like kind of defend them, be like, hey, this is why this should go in. So then there's like this whole big explanation if you go look at those logs and look at those email lists of why we added features and arguments of different feature sets and all that. Um, you can read the source code, which is kind of self-explanatory. You can just learn how it works based on reading it. Um, this is kind of the full stack of computer engineering. Full stack is a term that's used in web development, which means that like you can understand how the front end works, everything you see, and then some of the back end with like databases and all that kind of stuff. But full stack from like computer engineering perspective, I think it means like you have you know you have that from like everywhere from hardware to the shell scripting. Um, yeah, because you have hardware design, Verilog. That's if you want to design like an actual CPU or anything like that, which I think is really cool. And assembly, which is you know what this, the code the CPU can actually understand, and Risk Five is a really good one. It's open source. It's just came out recently from Berkeley. It's really popular now for like education and that kind of thing, and just actually in general. Uh, compiled language that means that's it's code that you can directly turn into that assembly. Um, it, the one that's most recommended is C. It's very popular. It, there's so much stuff written in it. C plus plus is another option. Um, but you should still learn C if you're going to learn, like, no matter what. It's a really important language. Um, interpreted language, that's uh, like a language that, well, it's kind of hard to explain, but um, it's they're, they're good for writing, like, quicker programs or if you want to write some, like, more, like, higher level programs sometimes. I think Python's a great one just because it's really easy to write programs in it. And you'll even if you're just, like, working in low-level computer engineering, you can always use Python for something. And then shell scripting, what that is, is if you're working in like the terminal, since it's all text-based, you know, if I want to delete a file and then create a new file and then like move it or something like that, you know, that's three commands, right? But then instead I can create a script that's like move, delete, or yeah, like move or delete, create, move or something like that. And I can have it like all so I can just run the script with that argument of whatever the file is going to be called and it'll like do that delete, create, move. And you can get some really cool stuff with that, just working on that like uh, terminal interface. Uh, I think it's really important to engage in projects because some people are just like, oh, I want to read books about coding or watch videos on coding. It's like, don't get me wrong, you should definitely do that. But if you're not actually like engaging any projects or putting your code to work, you're not actually going to learn anything. And also sometimes people just like do the, YouTube videos and like use just write the example code verbatim. And I think there is something like good about, you know, exactly rewriting something every once in a while, just so you can kind of stick it in your head. But at the same time, you should also like try writing stuff on your own. And I think these are the kind of projects that are good for computer engineering. You can fill your needs with like, you know, maybe home automation, which is really. Um, I think you logged out. Yeah, I think he disconnected. 
Yeah. Let's give it one, one second. It's fine. You're very interesting. Yeah, we're learning a lot. Yeah, actually, um, I can answer some of the questions because I think I know some of the answers. Um, okay, go ahead. So Jeff asked, um, when did Ryan start his computer engineering journey? Um, I think you mentioned that it was three to four years ago. And for probably more time, like uh, one to two like, years ago. Also, I can continue going now. Oh, yeah. You know what it was? The, the that Python course I took was probably more like exactly around two years ago. But when I really started to get into it, was right about when the pandemic happened or no, probably a few months before that, but probably a few months before the pandemic happened in that like March something. -eth. Um, yeah, so you should engage in projects, you know, home automation, you know, maybe you have a keyboard or something that doesn't work with your computer because it's a really old and there's no drivers for it. You could write one. Um, you can just explore something purely educational like Maybe you want to design an operating system. Obviously, it's not going to be like the operating system you're going to use all the time because you're not going to be able to write as good of an operating system as you know modern operating systems. But you'll still learn a lot, and it's still a really good project. Like that's the kind of thing that I like to do a good amount. And then you can also contribute to open source because you know these open source projects they're usually not by like a big company. I mean, sometimes people from companies contribute to them, but they're not like driven by a big company. They're just driven by people who use them and like to contribute like code to them and develop them. And these are different things like the user space, which is kind of like higher level operating system stuff and actual programs. Um, this is the GNU tool chain compilers and all that kind of thing. X windows, which is how you display everything, like actually manages all your displaying stuff. And if so, if you ever want to run anything graphical, that's it's working on X Windows, at least on Linux and Mac actually uses something pretty similar. Um, I3 is like a Windows manager that is pretty cool. Um, Muzzle, oh, that's a C library, which is just like a bunch of different code functions that you're able to use. Um, kernels, which is like lower level operating system stuff. You have any of the BSDs which are actually projects that originally came from Berkeley, but have been like since not from Berkeley anymore and they've like became their own projects. And Linux, obviously, computer architecture, these are different kinds of chips that you can work on microwatt. And then open firmware is, is just like, firmware is what kind of like lets your hardware and your software work together. Like it runs on chips in your keyboard or something like that and it like interacts with your computer. And then an example would be OpenBMC and U-Boot, which both work to actually turn on your computer. And this is a C project that I did. It's microcontroller driver design. A microcontroller is kind of just like a tiny computer that can't do some advanced things like memory management and all this other complex stuff, but it can do like simpler things. And yeah. And I wrote some code to like, I wrote drivers, which are basically just things that work with hardware. So the first one I wrote was, you know, something that could blink an LED. And another one I wrote was, you know, something that was a little bit more complex and could, you know, receive switch input if I had like a physical switch that was completing a circuit. And then I had another one that was like data transmission via this protocol. And you can go online and like read the protocol specs and stuff. And I actually used like a, a course for that. The course was okay. I'm sure there's better resources, honestly, for that. The course was could have been a lot better. But um, yeah, concepts, you learn how to read these technical documents because the when you want to learn, when you want to like figure out the specification for that stuff, you really just Google like documentation for this and you just read a thousand page documentation and try to find the one specific like address. An address is like 30, it's like eight characters long. And you have to read the whole book from that and find the section that you want. And it's a bit annoying, but you kind of get used to it. And it's actually a really good skill. And you learn how to develop a large project, which is really cool because I mean, that's kind of how I like was I'm really good at like this Hattie stuff because I know how to develop like a large project. And you learn how to write better C code because it's you're probably going to do this in C. You could do it in C. Um, you could write code that doesn't stand on an operating system, which is cool because you kind of learn like what an operating system is actually providing you. You know, if you take it away, then you learn like what you're missing, that phrase.
Um, yeah, you have computer architecture, which is like a, this is another project I did, it's CPU design. Um, I actually wrote like a computer processor that's capable of executing standard code. It was based on the RISC-V instruction set, which is really simple. Um, concepts, you learn how like hardware versus software code and how that works. Because when you code like hardware, it's a lot different. Um, key aspects of a CPU, like how it is, like what parts of the CPU does it have to actually work? Um, why certain operations take more or less time? Like, you know, division is really complex and it takes like 20 to 30 times how long addition takes for some reason. And there actually is a really cool reason for that, but I'm not gonna get into that, but it's actually pretty interesting. Um, how CPU designers create faster processors, you know, companies like Qualcomm and Intel and all that, every year they're like, here's our new faster processor. It's like 20% faster. And then you'll go buy your new computer with the new faster processor, but how does it actually get faster? I mean, like conceptually, there, obviously there's only one way to like add things with hardware it should, but they have like all these fancy ways of getting it faster and the von neumann model computing is just this way of it's this idea that if you have like something that can like run code and you have a set of memory that stores the code you can actually just you can have like a very few set of instructions that you can do with that data and then I'm not actually that good at explaining it. You should probably just Google that one. Um, skills, uh, you learn how to write and understand assembly language, which is like really low level stuff. And help, that'll help you if you ever work in C because C becomes assembly language when you compile it. And then writing Verilog is like, it's a hardware design language that they use a lot in CPU design and all that kind of stuff. And this is a little bit about my lead engineering, being a lead engineering intern at Hattie. Uh, I find and integrate free and open source solutions to solve problems. Uh, I manage systems. Uh, whenever the server breaks, I have to fix that. I have to set up all the server stuff. I've learned some new stuff because I didn't know everything about that and always good to learn new stuff. Um, sometimes I write code to accomplish tasks where solutions don't already exist. Uh, I also manage the external development teams. And this is just a final recap, I think. I, there might actually be one or two more slides, but I think it might be the final recap. Um, this is just like, where do you start? Uh, use Linux, get coding, and always dive deeper into how things work. Awesome. Thanks for presenting, Ryan. Oh, yeah. Let's see, what's the chat? Oh, actually, yeah. So I can answer this question really fast that Kane asked, which because it's related to what I do. So. Um, I actually helped um, do college consulting. So I, I was, I'm Ryan's college consultant. And I think so far he got into schools like Drexel, um, Cal Poly Pomona. I got into Cal Poly, not yeah. Cal Poly Pomona. I got into Cal Poly Slow too. Oh, slow. Yeah, and then also um, uh, the one- at, oh, I did get into Cal Poly Pomona. I got, I got into all the Cal Poly. Yeah, but what was, the, what, was the, what was the one in the Bay Area? Like the one- uh, Santa Clara. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. So, um, and then we're waiting on the UCs. So, yeah. Um, okay. I'll be talking about my experience with college consulting. So, um, here are some quick facts from last year. So, because I'm, um, I'm an economics major, I was really interested in um, what happened during the coronavirus pandemic with unemployment and also the stock market. So, unemployment in August 2020, which is last fall was basically double before March 2020. And I think um, before then, the unemployment rate was like super, super low, which is also very interesting. So basically, this led me to think um, a lot of people are unemployed uh, out of their job. I also have a lot of free time because we're all stuck at home and college app season is starting. So all of these combined me to like want to help people who are struggling or just anyone I knew. Um, kind of provide a cheaper or free option for college consulting. And the reason why I wanted to do, to do this was because I always enjoyed tutoring one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I've done it my all four years in high school and also knew a lot of younger people. So people grades, um, one or two grades below me in high school. And I've always had an interest in entrepreneurship. So all this um, basically all came together last fall, which is when I started my college consulting business. And it's been around six months and we recently just wrapped up 
2020 to 2021 college application season um, in January. So this is what, th these are some things that set me apart from more traditional college consultants. So I like to get to know the client personally. And um, because I'm very close to age to my clients, it's a lot easier to get to know them more personally because I'd say a lot of college consultants are around the age like um, maybe 40 to 50 or maybe even older. And I mainly use social media messaging and text. And my logic here is that um, with emails, it takes time to like check them and reply, but with social media messaging or text, I can get the notification and just reply very fast. And also most people nowadays use um, social media to message, um, at least like as in young people. And also um, everything was remote. So I use Zoom to do all my meetings. And I realized that there's not that much of, of a difference between Zoom and in-person meetings for college consulting. And it's actually, it might actually be easier to do Zoom meetings because you can share the screen and edit live and stuff like that. And also you don't have to waste time on travel. And yeah, I already mentioned number four. And number five, I also have um, a lot of connections with people in my grade um, because you know I go to CCA and a lot of people go to really good schools. And it's really easy for me to find specialized editors to edit people's essays. So for example, last year, I found someone who edited some of my Duke essays. I also found someone to edit some of my Wellesley essays. Um, so as you guys know, I go to UC Berkeley and last fall I had five full-time clients. So, you know, Berkeley is very busy, obviously. Um, it's really hard, I'd say it's, probably the hardest you see along with UCLA. Um, but actually last fall, I didn't take that many hard classes. Um, and I also weren't, wasn't in like that many extracurriculars. I think I just did one club and my Hattie internship and five full-time clients. So it wasn't too busy, but definitely the classes were still hard, like because there's a lot of grade deflation and it's competitive and you're basically being compared to all the other smart, smart kids who got into Berkeley. So for five full-time clients, um, I have an hour long meeting for each client weekly, plus additional meetings if needed. So I think one or two of my clients, they required like more than an hour on average per week. So maybe 1.5 because they were applying to like 30 schools, which is pretty insane. I think we just talked a lot. So we spent more than an hour every week. Oh yeah. So that's also part of my meetings. Like I think um, I try to like talk to the, my client to get to know them better so that like I can bring out more in their essays. And I find it like, okay, so actually a lot of my um, improvements I feel like are based on my own experience with college consulting. So um, when I did college consulting, I paid someone, right? But like, I, I felt like I didn't meet with them that much and I wasn't really close with them and they were just kind of an essay editor. They weren't really, they didn't really get to know me. So I try to get, get to know my clients really well um, so I can pull out like, um, their personal stories, because that's what colleges are looking for. So yeah, I'd say around three to five hours are spent in total per, or in total for all five clients per week, but like depending on deadlines, obviously, um, if something's due the next week, and if, there, if there's a lot of clients who are piling on work, then I have to do all that work by that deadline. So yeah, um, in total around eight to 10 hours of extra work. So this is kind of just like working on the weekends. So not too bad. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think um, even though the time commitment's not too high, it's more of like an emotional commitment because like you want your clients to do well. And um, it's just like, if you don't do a really good job or if you don't edit things perfectly, or if you don't give good advice, like they might not get into the schools they want to. And if I don't get into my colleges, I'm blaming you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is like, um, like obviously, I'm not held liable, but it's just like, emotionally, I feel very um, committed to that. I like to know that you feel emotionally committed to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure you're gonna get into the colleges you did. I mean, so far, good results, right? I think you got two huge scholarships so far, right? What was it like, 18? Uh, yeah, Drexel and RIT. Yeah, RIT was like 18.5K per year, right? and Drexel was like 11K or something like that. Uh, some, no, Drexel was pretty high, Drexel was like, 20 something k oh, they, yeah, but they so, also have a really high tuition yeah so it even they're, out. they're all like merit scholarships so yeah okay so then my plan for this fall this coming fall 
is so right now I have one paid client um, and I, I kind of started working with him, but like right now there's not too much that can be done. So, but like, so I'll probably start um, go, doing full time with him around June or July. And I'm also occasionally posting videos to my YouTube channel. Um, so whenever I have an idea or like a thought I want to talk about regarding college consulting, I'll put that there. And um, currently I have maybe around three videos. I think one video is about my profile that got me into Berkeley and USC and uh, Northeastern and some other ones about like what to do before this fall. And my third um, plan is I'm planning to mentor some students at a UC Berkeley startup, and that's launching in around uh, half a month. And then for future plans, I want to take anywhere between five to 10 clients this fall, but I'll probably do around five because um, I just feel like 10 clients is like pretty insane amount of work. It's like 20 hours per week. So, um, or like between 15 to 20. So it's like an actual like part-time job. Um, but five is a lot more manageable and also allows me to like have some free time to do other things or like just um, relax a bit, I guess. Um, and then I also plan to continue posting YouTube videos. But I think in the fall, like once I'm starting to work full-time with clients, I'm not gonna post YouTube videos because I won't have the time. And then number three is also to find more specialized editors. And Actually, one way I'm planning to source them is like for my current clients. Um, so if they get into like a good school, I'll just use them because I know them personally. And it's a lot easier to um, kind of work with someone you already know than find a new person to do business with. Okay, um, and so we're done with the presentation and we have some questions in chat. So I think we'll start with Ryan. I can't see any of the questions. Yeah, I'll ask you. So um, yeah, I can't see anything after the thing that uh, Kane said about what schools I was interested in going to. Okay. Well, I can see everything after that. I can't see anything before that. I see. Okay. Um, so you said you started learning computer engineering one to two years ago. Oh, you already answered that question. Okay. So what exact um, edX Python class do you recommend? Um, that's a good question. I know that there's a good one from, uh, I think it's one of those Illinois, like Urbana Champlain or Champagne. Right? I, I don't know how to pronounce that school, but it's that like UI UC or something like that. It's not a UC school, but it's like whatever that school is. I think they have a pretty good one. I know there's the CS50 class with, that's in, that's in C though. I'm not really sure exactly. I don't think they run the one that I did anymore. It was pretty okay. It could have been a little bit better. I like the edX format just because they do kind of like hold you to actually taking tests and getting a grade. And even though like you might not get college credit or get anything like, you know, you might not mean anything. It can, you know, you get that like, oh yeah, I did good. I have to like try hard so I can get that good grade. So you can feel like that, which is nice. Um, um, did you take all three CS classes offered in TP? I did not. I, well, since I just moved here, I did not actually take any CS classes at my old school. And this year I just took AP Computer Science A, which you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to go into AP Computer Science A. They kind of yelled at me for that. But if you ask really nicely and you already have coding experience, which is a good thing. If you take that Python class, one of those ones that you find online, you might be able to use that as an excuse to get into the AP CSA class. Um, yeah, I took only the AP CSA class and I did not, I did not organize a computer science club. I am in the uh, quantum computing club and. Mm, okay. So we just lost Ryan and uh, he will come back. So regarding Python, I just want to share that uh, at NextStream, um, we offer Python as part of the machine learning. So quite a few students here, I think, are taking NextStream's machine learning. So the first course flow is ML100. That's more about machine learning. And then after that, you will take Python as ML200 uh, flows. OK, so I'll be back to Ryan. I think it's still I'm sorry. Don't we all love Zoom and this like frequent failure? I think it's my computer because I can't run the like desktop version of Zoom, so I have to run the really weird browser version, which is really interesting right now. Um, yeah, so I have not taken any of those. I'm in the Computational Thinking Club and uh, the Quantum Computers Club. 
And then also another question was, um, do you recommend any hardware platform middle school and high school students can get their hands dirty and play with for computer? So like what platforms are good for computer engineering? That's a good question, actually. I mean, there's a lot of different approaches to that. My approach is basically just install Linux on your main computer and break everything and then install it again and break everything. <laughs> but I get that people mo like often don't want to do that. A lot of people like Raspberry Pis, and I don't really love them too much because they don't like the kind of Linux they run is a bit weird. And there's like a lot of weird stuff when you get down into it, but they are not a bad option if you want to go into that. You can also look into running a virtual machine and then mess around with that. Um, that's pretty like important, I think. Um, yeah, and there's you can probably find a virtual machine for like for free online that you can pay for not for free but you can probably pay for one but i'd recommend running on your own computer it's not too hard you can download i think they call it like vmware's virtual box um yeah uh, and other questions yeah so um what's your plan in college and what's your future passion i mean i think it's pretty obvious already but uh oh, yeah computer engineering i want to go into operating systems hopefully or at least like Maybe the hardware, but like something that's, um, yeah. And, uh, um, yeah. Schools you're interested. Oh, you already answered that. Um, yeah. So actually when we applied to college for Ryan, um, I think he, I think we only applied to engineering programs. So like, um, and also schools that had very strong operating systems research. So for example, I think Boston University was um, one of his top picks because uh, there's a professor there that he actually like personally really liked and did research or like um, study something similar mm -hmm. to that, what that pers professor was researching. Um, yeah, I mean, do you have any like specific, like what's like your top pick for school? Do you think? That's a good question. Um, one of the things is if you're applying, if this was that, that's why you asked the question is if you're actually looking or potentially looking at schools, all those schools that I applied to are like really good options. The one that I might have wanted to apply to that I didn't and I kind of regret it would be Cornell. And other than that, I like am really satisfied with everything I applied to. Um, yeah. And my top choices are probably UC San Diego, UC Berkeley and um, uh, Cal Poly Slope, which I got into, so it's nice. Um, and maybe UCLA. Yeah, I mean, Berkeley's and UCSD's um, computer engineering is really strong. Okay, so what's, what, okay, what middle school summer camps do you suggest? Um, do you know of any? I think that was a question for you. Unless, I mean, I could answer it, but I think that might have been a question for you. I think it happened when you were talking. Oh, really? Um, Oh, like for oh, in terms of college apps. Um, okay, so so iPhone 2, I don't know who that is. But first of all, let me just say that when you apply to colleges, they mainly look at your high school um, activities. So if you have a kid in middle school, I think definitely what they do right now, it's not going to directly impact their college apps. But like, it, like if you can have them go to a summer camp to get them interested or like kind of figure out what their passion is, um, then in high school, they can like really explore that passion. And then that's something to write about on your college apps. But like, I'd say that like in middle school, like it doesn't really matter unless like you continue doing something. So for example, let's say um, you're really good at a sport like ice skating and you compete from middle school and all the way through high school, then you can definitely say like, I started in middle school, right? But like, if you do something in middle school and you end it there, like the colleges don't really care about that. Uh, okay. At what year of their high school do you take clients? Oh, do I take clients? Um, so I mainly try to focus on taking clients who are um, like seniors. So like, for example, this fall, they would be seniors. But like, I definitely will, like, I'm definitely considering taking clients like a bit earlier, but I prefer to take like the youngest, maybe a sophomore or junior. Um, Cause I feel like freshman year, like uh, I think it's just a time for them to explore in high school. Like that's what I did. And I only seriously started thinking about college apps when I was a junior. And I feel like it's not like, um, it's kind of actually counterproductive to think about college apps super early. Um, it's kind of like, you know, thinking about your grade when you study, like, I think as if you like focus on 
learning the subject or like figuring out your passions, like you're going to have much greater results than just focusing on the result. Um, let's see. Okay, so question for you, Ryan. What concepts are important in a software engineering environment other than programming? Um, GitHub, unit testing, databasing. Um, I was actually just writing something about um, hardware platforms. I'm still thinking about that question that was asked. Uh, if you want to actually get into the lower level stuff, you could also get a microcontroller. I have one. I'll show you. Now, if you want to do code that will actually, if you want to write like actual code that'll run and it'll do, do maybe blink an LED or something like that, that would be what you do on a microcontroller like this. This is the STM32 F407, I think. Um, and this is an FPGA, which is a little bit different because you can actually do stuff like design CPUs on that stuff, on that, because instead of doing like hardware, you do like digital logic design, which is really cool. Um, and what software things do I recommend? Uh, what, are, what are the software? Things? All right. Um, that's actually a really good question. I think it's important to learn Git. It's really important. And people use Git in different ways. There's like the standard way of using Git, and there's the Linux way of using Git, where people just email commits. That's like an older way of using like version control before we had the internet or before the internet was actually really good. We just emailed everything. So that was kind of their solution. They still do. Wow, friends, Zoom is lagging a lot today. No problem. Yeah, there are questions for you, Eric. Oh yeah. Um, okay, so, so someone directly messaged me. So, okay, so if you guys have any questions, just like post them publicly, publicly so everyone can see. But, um, yeah, I posted my YouTube link and then my major is economics plus statistics. And I'm also very interested in education, but I'm not sure if I'm going to get like an education minor or teaching minor. I feel like I can just, cause like I already know how to tutor people and I'm already doing that as like my part-time job. So yeah, I mean, um, definitely like econ plus statistics right now. Okay. What um, AP exemption? Yeah. Oh yeah. Ryan, continue. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So testing, is a good question. You should definitely figure out like a little bit of unit testing and then try like read a little bit into TDD. I'm not sure if it's like the best thing to do, but it's definitely important to like learn about test driven development. And then like coding refactoring and that that's actually a pretty complex topic. And like, I'm not sure if you should get into that until you're like really far into coding. But a good way of like kind of learning that is just read code a lot and figure out how other people do it. And maybe read like some coding books in general, just so you can figure out how like people approach different problems. So when you go to write your code, you can be like, oh, well, actually that's a better way to do it. And that's a better way to do it. And that's pretty uh, good way to do it. And for just running your code, uh, compilers are important, learn those. And then Linux is good. You can run them in Docker if you really want to, but that's complicated. Okay, um, and then someone asked the question about AP exams. So if you want to go into computer science, I'd say definitely take um, the, I think it's APCSP and APCSA classes and exams. Right. And then for engineering, definitely physics, like calculus, um, stuff like that, like step, very STEM oriented subjects. But I think like a lot of people actually go into CS without ever taking CS in high school. So cause, because CS is like a very popular major. Um, but for engineering, I'd recommend like doing um, stuff like robotics and like definitely taking physics and up to physics C if you can, because uh, engineering is like, I feel like it's a lot more like you have to do a lot more prep in high school for that. Um, okay, so Bob Wu asks, how can I differentiate, differentiate myself from other college applicants? Um, Bob, actually, like, if you can hear me, do you want to like go on? This there? thing crashes like one more time. <laughs> Do you want to like go on your mic and just like tell me a bit about yourself and I can just kind of like give some tips if you want, or you can just type in chat. Cause like, um, I don't really know like what your profile looks like. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I type it. Oh, and about that AP 
question for colleges. It's definitely important to take CSP because I mean, it looks good, but also yeah. CSP, like learning wise, isn't the best class. I want to say like, it doesn't actually teach you too much. Yeah. I like, I think CSA is a much better class. And if you can somehow skip CSP, I might recommend that. Yeah, like actually I took both CSP and CSA because I was considering um, CS as a major and that's like what I applied for to some colleges. Um, I think CSP, it's like very good if you've never had any coding experience or if you're not like that good with logic or algorithms. Um, but it's like a lot more conceptual ideas like because I think the test is like basically just a project and a really easy multiple choice um, test. But then for CSA, it's like a lot more like you actually do like more hardcore projects. And, um, yeah, you I can actually like, self-study and then yeah. do the CSA, and that might put you in a lot better place because then you'll understand like most of the stuff that's on the CSA exam anyway. And that's kind of where I was when I started to take CSA this year. I was like, I understand most of this. Yeah, exactly. But I think like um, both Ryan and I's approach to like education and learning stuff is for, at least for coding um, on Ryan's side, I, I think he's like, always done it like try to learn about some uh, yeah yeah and then but like and also for me like for college consulting and tutoring like it's no one ever taught me how to tutor you know I always just enjoy doing it I learned it by myself and same for college consulting um, and I think like for any type of consulting a lot of the times like you might need to get some certifications but um, I think college consulting you don't but like let's say for financial consulting you do but like um like a lot of the times it's just like going out and exploring how to do it by yourself. Okay, so Babu just typed out, okay, asking in general. Okay, so you're a freshman going to high school, very competitive, general advice. Okay, so he wants general advice as a freshman. Okay, so I think it's definitely like college consulting is very, or sorry, college admissions is very competitive. Um, but I think like, uh, it's definitely good that you're thinking about it right now, but it might be, it might not be that good to have like the mindset that like you're trying to get an edge over other people because although like definitely if someone gets in like um, other people are not getting in, but it doesn't mean like someone gets in and you don't. Like it's not like a direct comparison. It's a lot more holistic approach, especially on like the more upper tier schools. But I think definitely like, you know, some major important parts are like testing, um, GPA, extracurriculars, leadership, volunteering, stuff like that. And then but like, if you definitely want to like get an edge over other um, applicants, like I'd say if you win an international STEM um, competition or just any international competition, like you're going to probably get into a good school just because like um, the number of people who win that international competition is so low. Um, and I say like for schools like Caltech and MIT, they really care about that kind of stuff. But for like Berkeley and UCLA, um, for me, like I got into Berkeley without winning any competitions. Actually, like I didn't really do any competitions. I just had a lot of leadership. I had a good GPA. And like, I actually explained this on my channel. So that's my first video. But yeah, um, and like, uh, I did some volunteering. I got like, I actually did a lot of volunteering. And yeah, I, I was just like, I'd say I was a pretty well-rounded candidate, but I wasn't like exceptional in any way. Um, but yeah. And then someone I think asked a me, really good thing to do with that is yeah. maybe instead of exploring the college like, like just trying to do stuff that's really good for your college, try to do stuff if, if you know what major you want to do, or even if you just have kind of an idea like, oh, I want to do psychology or, oh, I want to do computer science or I want to do um, mechanical engineering, try to do something like that or learn about it. And then you can, not only can you put that on your college resume, but you can also put that on like actual resume. <laughs> And you can use it to apply for like internships, the knowledge that you build. Like I think the knowledge that I built, like self-studying computer science, like that is so much more useful than if, than if I spent that time doing like SAT prep or something. Not that that's like a bad thing to do, but like I think that I like gained so much more long term. And even if I went, even if I didn't get into good colleges, I would still probably be in a better place than the people who did go to those good colleges but didn't actually know that much because they didn't apply themselves. That's a really important thing, like actually applying yourself outside of just, I want to go to the best college. It's, I want to be the best, you know, person at what I do. Yeah, exactly. And also like, um, since you're a freshman, that's good advice because I think if you focus on like 
um, finding out what you really like to do and getting like trying to start getting good at it. Um, when you apply to internships, um, you, you, you have a higher chance of getting in or like if you apply for research. And I'd say like research and internships definitely helps with your college applications. Um, what else? Oh, also, another thing is like, it's not always about going to the best school. It's more about like going to the best school that like the, to the school that has the best program for you. So like, um, obviously Harvard has like good programs everywhere, but like uh, maybe the number one computer engineering program is not actually at Harvard, it might be another school. Um, so like, Bob, if yeah, you want. I think that's actually the coolest thing about something like engineering is that the hardest engineering programs to get into I mean, like, obviously the hardest ones are like MIT and Stanford, which is like probably the best too. But there's a lot of them that are like really, really good, but then also have like 30, 40, 50% acceptance rates as compared to something like, you know, maybe like econ or finance. I think that's a little bit harder to find unless you want to go into like those really, not as hard to find everywhere it teaches it, but like it's harder to find really good programs unless you go into those like top schools. Yeah. But with computer science, there's all these like, RIT, Drexel, and all that kind of thing. They have like a pretty high acceptance rate, but they're actually like really, really good schools. And they're e super easy to get internships and all that kind of thing. Um, so Bob, if you want to like type some of your interests or like maybe just some activities you do and like um, maybe I can give some advice on that. Oh, and also if anyone is interested in like just asking me questions later after this meeting, um, feel free to like um, directly message me and ask, you, ask me for my contact info. Actually, I, I can just put it here. Um, so I mainly use Discord, actually. So let me see my code. We converted you into a Discord man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like, even though like people might say like, you know, using so social media to like contact your clients is like not formal. Like for me, I think it's a lot more, at least my approach is a lot more efficiency focused. Um, yeah, and honestly, I kind of hate email because I'm a part of like a lot of tech mailing lists, so it's really hard to actually read my email. Wait, how do I how do I find out my code? Oh wait, okay. Let's see, like I get probably a hundred or more emails a day. Yeah, so that's my Discord. If you guys want to contact me and just like right now, just feel free to ask me any questions. Um, and if you're interested in my services, just also contact me through that.